praise you, bless you. We lift you up, Lord Jesus. Father, we love you, we exalt you. You're not only the most high God, you're the only God. You're the one and only God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we exalt you and we lift you up. We recognize today that you are not only loving, you are also holy. You are a holy God. And uh, that's really difficult for us to completely grasp and understand, but we recognize that you are a holy God, and we recognize that the words that you bring us are holy words. And I pray uh, today, dear God, that we would be able to hold both you and them in that most high regard. We thank you and praise you that when you send your word and we believe it and we receive it and we respond to it, we are saved by it. But I also pray today, dear God, that you would remind us that when we reject it, we reject you in the salvation that it was meant to bring us. I pray that today, dear God, we would recognize the gravity of you, your name, your kingdom, your holiness, and the implications of receiving or rejecting your most powerful words and espousing and speaking versus withholding them from your precious people. Jesus, you are the head of the church, and I pray that today, though I'm the pastor and I'm speaking today, I pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you would fill me and you would clothe me, and it would be as if you were speaking to your people. I pray that your precious people would not first and foremost see me today. I pray that first and foremost, they would see you. Um, I say that many weeks, and I mean it every week, um, but I really mean it today. We love you and we praise you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. So I kind of an um, interesting week in my sermon prep. I'll take you through it a little bit. I uh, moved into Acts chapter 2, wrote a great sermon, felt really good about it, was locking it in. I had to fly up to Boston on Thursday and Friday. I was working on it on the plane. Had a lot of confidence. I was ready to roll with it. And it's sitting there and it's prepared and it's ready. But then I got home on Friday and uh, I started getting into some things and, and God kind of started messing with me a little bit. One of the things that happened was that uh, one of our members here is a part of the Black Robe Regiment and they're a group of Christian leaders, pastors especially, who are politically active. I'm not a part of the group. I know the group. I respect the group, but I'm not personally a part of the group. But some of our members here are and they've asked me to put out a voter guide for the upcoming election in Virginia, which is November 8th, which is really this just one, there's just one thing you know, somebody running for Congress. So they asked for this, and, you know, it's, it's a pretty fair piece. It's just here are the major issues, and here's where they stand on them, and read it and think about it and, and make your own decision on who to vote for. And they asked me if they could do this, and I said that they could do this a while ago. And, and then uh, they sent the, you know, they sent the voter guide to me, and I looked at it. As a matter of fact, I, I printed it off. I got all kinds of paper up here today. I printed it off this week, and... And I recognized, like, in my spirit, like, I was a little wishy-washy, you know? And I wasn't wishy-washy because I think it's inappropriate for Christians to be politically active. I've made that very clear, what I think about that. And I wasn't wishy-washy because I thought the way they were doing it was inappropriate. I thought it was very appropriate the way they were doing it. And I wasn't wishy-washy because uh, I thought I would offend you guys by, you know, showing you where these candidates stand on the issues. I, I don't really know why I was wishy-washy. It was kind of like, do I even need to do this? Is this even anything we need to talk about? I mean, we got a pretty small church, and I think I know everybody, and I kind of think I know where most people stand on most things. So we probably, I don't know if we really need to do this. And so uh, it was Friday, and I was in the garage. I live in my garage. I don't sleep there unless Elaine's mad at me, but uh, my garage is kind of my, my place in the house, and we all hang out in the garage. It's bizarre thing. Kate knows. She looks over and we're always in our garage, right, Kate? It's like six people and four dogs always in the garage. And um, so I go over to the mailbox to get the mail. And for the fourth time in the last four weeks, um, I got a voter guide in the mail. But it wasn't addressed to me and it wasn't from the Black Robe Regiment. It was actually addressed to my daughter for the fourth time in four weeks. My 21-year-old daughter was getting a voting guide from Planned Parenthood. I didn't get the voting guide from Planned Parenthood. 
My 14-year-old son didn't get the voting guide from Planned Parenthood because he's not old enough to vote. My wife didn't get the voting guide from Planned Parenthood. My 21-year-old daughter got the voting guide from Planned Parenthood. And I'm like, oh. So they're targeting 21-year-old girls with a voting guide, but also they're just targeting 21-year-old girls with their agenda to be politically active. And basically the word is like, Vote for who we lead you to vote for and make sure you vote so that when you are pregnant and when you need an abortion, we have the ability to do that for you. And so I'm like, here I am, so wishy-washy on talking to people that I know, my own spiritual family, about the issues of the day, but Planned Parenthood isn't wishy-washy. They're coming right after my daughter under my own roof in my own house. They're targeting her. They know, they know my kids. And I'm sure they have ways of getting to her through social media and any other. I mean, they, they know us all, right? Like, there's no secrets to any. And so I'm like, ah, oh, this is getting real. And I got a little less wishy-washy. Then I put on my earphones. I put on, you know, I had my phone and... I started listening to a podcast as I went out to cut the grass, and I went out to cut the grass, and I heard this story about something that's happening, a terrible thing that's happening in our country right now. There's a group of people that were protesting outside of, they say protesting, who were singing hymns and praying prayers out in front of an abortion clinic, and apparently they got too close to the building, and they broke trespassing laws, and they were arrested or detained, and they were given a fine of a thousand, two thousand bucks and told if they're going to do that, they can't stand so close and life goes on. No, nothing new and nothing, I think, massively inappropriate about that. Like we have private property laws. You don't get to stand at the front door of the church, but you can stand out there on the grass and one day they probably will and say whatever you think about us. It's a free country and free speech. And so that didn't alarm me. What alarmed me was what happened after that. And that is that this thing that was being taken care of as a local misdemeanor actually showed up on the radar of the federal government. And the DOJ sent out the FBI to each and every one of these homes and raided them. Like I've seen the video. And charged them, arrested them with assault weapons around their house like they were terrorists, threw them in a car and charged them with federal conspiracy charges that carries up to 11 years in prison and $350,000 in fines because they trespassed. They're misinterpreting some federal law and they're throwing the book at these people because they stood outside of an abortion clinic and sang hymns, prayed prayers, and said, you shouldn't do this. And you can have your own opinions about how appropriate or not that is, but that's not, it's your constitutional protected right, right? And I don't know if these guys are going to win in the court, but the three things coming together for me at that moment, it, I was having a moment where I realized this is real, the, the, the war is real. And life and death is very much on the ballot this year and I need to not be afraid to talk about that and so I was kind of getting getting ready to do that and as I was cutting the grass I felt like the Lord saying and I, I apologize if I meander a little bit and I'm disorganized but this is hot off the press right as I was out cutting the grass the Lord began to really speak to me about what it means to be persecuted for your faith it's, not, it's something I knew that ha has existed for quite some time for people all around the world. It is not something that I ever thought really pretty much any Christian in the United States dealt with that much. Sometimes we, somebody's rude to us for our faith, and we call that, I don't call that persecution. I call that life. 
Persecution to me is these people in Iran who have power encounters with God. They go to bed. They have a dream about Jesus. They wake up. They know Jesus. They begin to follow Jesus. They begin to say, I love Jesus. Next thing you know, they're excommunicated from their family. They're thrown out of their village. They're abused. They're imprisoned. In many cases, they're killed for their faith. That's persecution and becoming a martyr for your faith. But it was like God was saying to me, there are more moderate forms of persecution. And if you're going to go out there and become more overt, then the persecution is going to become more overt because being persecuted for your faith in this country is not very likely going to be persecuted for saying you're a Christian or being persecuted for wearing a T-shirt that says Jesus loves you. You're going to be, I'm going to be persecuted for our faith in the word of God and the courage and the boldness we have to espouse the word of God, the truth of God, and even apply it into our circumstances. These people who were detained for trespassing needed to wise up. These people who are targeted by the DOJ for exercising freedom of speech and being called conspiracy conspiracists are being persecuted for their faith in the word of God and their willingness to espouse it publicly as the Bible says that we should. So to be persecuted for your faith in God means to be persecuted for your faith in God's word or the way that God reveals himself to us. It's to be persecuted for the way God reveals himself to us in nature, as we talked about last week. It's to be persecuted for how God reveals himself to us through the Bible, the special revelation of God, as we talked about last week. It's being persecuted for what we believe and what God has shown us to be true about creation and all things, about him, about us, about sin, about righteousness, the willingness to espouse it, to be the city on a hill, to be a lamp on a lampstand and even apply it into circumstances to interpret it all the way down to where the rubber meets the road for the purpose of not offending people, though it is offensive in nature, seeing them cut to the heart so that they might repent and be saved. So, in this country, we are, and we have been for quite some time, beginning to be experienced are beginning to experience persecution for our faith in God's word. And by the way, none of this is my main, my main point yet. I'll get to the main point. Corporations, this is just a little illustration. This is not futuristic. This is not where they say it's going to go. It's an absolute fact, Jack, right now. Big corporations, Fortune 500 corporations, in this country have a new code financially, and it's not just... Your credit report is something called ESG, Environmental, Social, and Governmental. And it's a score. And it's not a score so the, the government so really uses. It's a score that the banks use, the, the global financial system uses, to, to decide, along with your credit worthiness, whether you as a corporation are going to have access to capital. And for corporations, they have to have access to capital. And it, and it really has nothing to do with your ability to financially perform. It has to do with where you stand on a host of items, a big, huge global agenda. That has to do with the environment, has to do with social issues, and has to do with government or the way you structure yourself according to this new global system. Among the things that corporations are graded on is how much they fund, how much they support, how much they espouse, Things such as LGBTQ plus issues, gender modification, transformation issues, making that available to their employees and to their employees' children, money to things like Planned Parenthood, abortion, and all of these things, social things that we would stand firmly against. And if we owned a Fortune 500 company or control one or had a lot of stock in one or invest in one, in, in the stock market, then we're subject to these new global rules. It's not legal, it's financial. Remember the mark of the beast, the way 
the Antichrist will take control will actually not be front through the law because he is the lawless one. It will actually be through finances. We will not be able to buy or sell without the approval of, of the beast. I start talking like this and people freak out, which will get me to my main point in a minute. But it's, it's not in the future, it's now. And so a company's views, their political views, the way they espouse those views, the way they support those views according to the global agenda affects their ability to access capital and to thrive in the economy, the marketplace of this world. So there's that. Current. Did you know everything is already in place to do the same thing to us personally and privately? Soon and very soon, without God restraining it, all currency will become digital. I know this is Orwellian and you think I'm like just... Do me a favor, we're going to talk about this in a minute. When I say something and you don't believe me and you think I've lost it, go and read a book and do research and correct me if I can be corrected, but get into it. Because I live with these thoughts. Already, everything is in place to move our currency to a global currency, to a digital currency. All this money that's being printed... And everything they're doing to the currencies, not only of our nation, but of this world, is by design to collapse it, to replace it, to consolidate it, and then to control it digitally. So the technology already exists. The plans have already been laid out. And when that happens, you and I will have a debit card in our hand or a chip on our hand call it whatever you want. The technology is already there. Or a vaccine in our body that has something running around that, that can be detected. You won't need a wallet. You won't need an ID. You won't need a credit card. You won't need a debit card. You won't need cash and you won't need change. It'll all be there encoded. Very easy for us to imagine. 20 years ago, impossible to imagine. Easy for us to imagine. Now, here's the thing that goes along with that. Your ability to spend, how much you have to spend, your access to capital, your access to mortgages will be attached not only to your credit score, but to your criminal record, to your political views, your theological views, if you will, and a host of other things like environmental, social, and governmental issues with you personally. It, it's, it's there. They're talking about it. They'll be able to tell you how, how, where you can go, how much you can spend. They can turn it on. They can turn it off based on not just your credit worthiness, but based on where you stand, whether your speech is considered hate speech or not. And it won't be legal. It'll be financial. And it's right there. Now, I'm not sure this is going to happen. I'm not sure that the Lord is going to let this happen. I think he might hold it back, but you need to know. It's like right there. It's right on the spot. And so I'm thinking about the voter guide, and I'm thinking about the Planned Parenthood voter guide, and I'm thinking about what happened to the people at the abortion clinic, and I'm thinking about, wow, like, this is real. It's a war. I've got to red pill myself, pull my head out of the sand, and I've been speaking maybe out of half of my mouth about it, but I'm going to have to have a full force conversation with my church about it, an ongoing conversation about it, and I felt like God saying, beware as you become more overt, the persecution will become more overt. And even if you're not persecuted legally, you could be persecuted financially. And being persecuted for your faith will not necessarily be being persecuted because you're a Christian. It will be being persecuted for your Christian beliefs and the way you apply them. But none of that is my main point today. I'm just setting the stage. I'm going to go back to Matthew chapter 10. We were in Matthew for... For nine and a half years, and I guess that wasn't enough. I'm going to go back into it today. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. Jesus said, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. He's speaking to the disciples. This is their training period of what they will be doing with the rest of their life. 
I perceive when Jesus is speaking to them, he is often speaking to us about now and the future as well. So the principles and the things he's saying were appropriate for them, and they are, if we interpret them into our circumstances, appropriate for us as well. As Diedrich Bonhoeffer says, you have to read the Bible like God is talking to you. So I'm reading the words of Jesus like Jesus isn't just talking to those disciples, but he's talking to us disciples today as well. Jesus says to them, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and yet as innocent as does. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. Now, a lot of the warnings in the passage that we'll read today about what will happen to them when they go out for him did not happen during this training session over the next week or two or a few weeks that they went out. It actually ended up happening to them later after Jesus rose from the dead and he sent them out with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And he's just matter-of-factly telling them that if you become overt, the persecution is going to become overt. And so be shrewd, prepare yourself for it, understand it, avoid it as much as possible. And when it gets you, be prepared not to overcome evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. Don't respond to it in kind. As a matter of fact, turn the other cheek. As a matter of fact, if they want to kill you, let them kill you. Don't worry about it too much because this is all really short-lived. But persecution is coming, but still not my main point today. In verse 18, on account... On my account, Jesus said, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. This persecution has purpose. So good news, it's coming, but it has purpose. So you can be a witness to them, to the Gentiles. This is to the Jews. But when they arrest you, not if they arrest you, by the way, but when they arrest you, when they persecute you, because they most certainly will, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. I got you. At that time, you will be given what to say. It will come upon you. It will erupt out of you. For it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Phenomenal. Still not my main point. Just setting up my main point. This one's terrible. Brother will betray brother to death. A father, his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. He was saying this to Jews about their Jewish families as they serve their Jewish God. He could just as well say to us, you will be persecuted. You will even be handed over to death, you might say, within your families in some form. And these will be Christian families because your Christian beliefs, anywhere between mild to incredibly terrible persecution. This is horrendous and a reality, and yet still not my main point. You'll be hated by everyone. (laughs) I hate that. You will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. That's a heck of a strategy, right? We always want to stand and fight. God's like, no, just get out of there. You've heard me say before, like when God tells you you're going to lose, you're going to lose. The only way to survive it is to get out of there. It's like the Hebrew people, right, when the Babylonians and God's like, yeah, you can't win. They thought they could win. They couldn't win. And they moved on. Truly, I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. So a little strategy and a lot of hope, but still not my main point. The student is not above the teacher nor a servant above his master. It is Enough for students to be like their teachers and servants to be like their masters. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household? So good news. The share in his suffering, we share in his glory. Quite quite an honor to be persecuted for our faith, not just in Christ, but in the word of Christ. Still not my main point. So do not be afraid of them. For there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So... 
he's saying at some point in the future, maybe not on this mission trip, but on your permanent mission trip in the future, I'm going to come to you and I'm going to speak to you by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to whisper secret things to you. I'm going to open up the Bible, the prophecies, the scriptures. I'm going to send you into a town and I'm going to tell you what's going on there even though you don't know what's going on there. You're going to stand in public. You're going to stand in private and I'm going to give you insight and things that seem to be secret you're going to expose and you're going to put out in front of people and it's going to be invasive in nature. It's going to be offensive in nature. It's going to judge the thoughts and the attitudes of their hearts It's going to lay everything bare before him to whom we must give an account. It's not going to just be generally offensive. It's going to be personally offensive. And it is the main ministry of the church and your main ministry. It is the ministry of God's word. Because they can't be saved and you can't be saved except by grace through faith in the word of God, which is the gospel and every other word it adds, which is telling the good news in the context of the bad news which is reminding people every word sent to save if received by faith will absolutely level you if you reject it through unfaith. And so get yourself ready for this. Jesus might have said, it's just like when I walk down the road with you. And don't you know, I mean, they walked all the time, right? A hundred miles from Galilee to Jerusalem. They walked it like we walked across the street. And I just imagine, I like to imagine things. I imagine they're walking up and down the road and Jesus maybe was trailing, would trail behind and pray and talk to his father and then occasionally he'd be like, hey, Peter, come here. Oh, he just called for me. Jesus wants to have a private conversation with me. It's either going to go really, really good or really, really bad. Hey, John, come on back here a minute. What did you do, John? You got busted. Like you couldn't, you would be walking 50 feet in front of Jesus and he'd be reading your mind and he'd say, yeah, I'm going to deal with that. And he'd pull you back and he'd look you in the eye and he'd deal with you. And the reason I know that is he deals with me. It's what he does. He reads our mind. He judges the thoughts and the attitudes of our heart. He hears everything. He sees everything everything and he loves us and he is nosy and things that no one else has a right to do and no one else has a right to say he has every right to do it and every right to say it you may say those people have no right to stand at that abortion clinic and say the things they're doing and do the things they're doing and maybe they have no right to do it but if it's Christ in them and upon them doing it then he has every right to do it and every right to say it And that's the nature of a relationship with a holy God. And it's how he saves us. But as we read in Acts last week, here's the verdict. We read it in John, but it's re-explained in Acts. Here's the verdict. Light is coming into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Therefore, they would not come into the light for fear that their deeds would be exposed. When you and I, knuckleheads, get up and stumble out of bed and walk out into the world and we're filled with the Spirit of God and filled with the Word of God and begin to espouse the Word of God through the Spirit of God, it's invasive, offensive, personal. It seems like we have no right, but the one who's carrying us along has every right, sees everything. And despite the fact that a majority of the time, this will be the verdict, for those who do have the courage to come into the light, He not only forgives, he saves and gives the right to become sons and daughters of God. This is why we put up with all this foolishness. And so you fall back and Jesus says, hey, man, I I just saw that lustful thought. I just saw the way you looked at that little Hebrew girl that walked by. Oh, no. I'm I'm sorry. You know, they never looked at Jesus and said, None of your business. They never looked at Jesus and said, it's just natural. They 
They looked at Jesus and said, I'm sorry, and he forgave them. Anyway, still, still not my main point. Just laying out to you the nature of the ministry of the church and our role in the world as the salt and the light. Helping you to imagine what will happen as your faith becomes more overt, as the faith of your church becomes more overt. God is warning us the persecution will become more overt. Prepare yourself for it. Get ready for it. Gird yourself for it. You can get along as a nice little Christian church and be off radar, and nobody will mess with you. But if you begin to stand not only for your faith in the name of God, in the name of Jesus, but for the truth of God, for the word of God, you're going to agitate people. Because the word of God doesn't just expose God to us, it exposes us to God and us to each other. It's a lot of exposure. You can be a Jew, you can be a Christian, you can be a Muslim, you can have your faith, you can have your stories. Just stay out of my business. It's none of your business. Stay out of my business. And our job is to go out and to say in the daylight what we heard in the dark and to some degree, as carefully and respectfully and with as much humility to get in people's business, but since we're carried along by the Spirit of God, which is Almighty God, which is a holy God, not just a loving God, sometimes the Spirit of God will have us speak in a tone and with boldness and severity that we're uncomfortable with. And they're going to look at us and say, who the, do you think you are? And we'll say, we don't know who we are, but we know who he is. And it's not me, it's Christ in me, and this is the offensive nature of salvation. It, it will undo you, still. Not, not my point, main point today. All right, Brian, so what's your main point? Okay, well, fast forward to Matthew chapter 24, verse 10, 11, and 12 for my main point. At that time, near the end, as the end approaches... And sin becomes more overt and righteousness becomes more overt. The Bible talks about a time when the the light will get lighter even as the dark gets darker. At a time, at different times in history, at different times in different nations for different reasons, at that time, at those times, with all that persecution, all that fear, The potential for faithful people in the church to lose their reputation, their careers, their livelihoods, whatever. Because of all of that, at that time, because of fear, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. So we're not talking about the synagogue. We're talking about the church. We're not talking about the faith of the Jews. We're talking about the faith of Christians. Our brothers and sisters, not in our biological household, but in our spiritual household. At that time, many of my disciples, Jesus might say, will turn away from the faith. They won't necessarily turn away from their faith in Christ, the name of Christ, being a Christian. They may not turn away from their faith in some of the words, but they'll maybe turn away from the faith in all the words. Remember, the command is to go and to teach them to obey everything that he commands. So at that time, because of persecution, because of reputation, because it used to be easy in America to keep a foot in the world and the foot in the church, there was no major violation. There were some temptations that were obvious and we needed to stay away from, but mostly we were lauded for our faith in God and the application of scriptures into our life, like it was generally accepted as a good thing, but not anymore. At that time, walking the walk and talking the talk and God's commands ever before us, some will turn away from the faith in God's word, I would add, and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets, false preachers, false teachers, replacing true prophets, true teachers, preachers, will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the overall atmosphere of wickedness, 
the love of most will grow cold. Isn't that interesting? Turning away from the faith in, in God's word is turning away from truth. Here he's saying that they will turn away or grow cold in their love. But the truth is we know that love and truth are tethered together. You can't have one without the other. God is love and God is truth. You turn away from truth, you turn away from love. You turn away from love, you turn away from truth. Jesus said, uh, if you love me, you will obey me. The eight commands are all about loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and loving your neighbor as yourself, right? Love and truth go hand in hand. Love tells the truth about God, about us, about everything, including in our testimony about ourselves. Let our flaws show. But the love of most will grow cold. I'd rather turn away from faith in God's word. I'd rather turn away from those who espouse faith in God's word. And in the name of love, not talk about certain things because I don't want to offend certain people who I'm trying to get closer to God. Of course, they can't come close to God without coming close to truth. It's just the nature of the thing. But whatever, it's a flawed philosophy. But really, it's not love, it's selfishness. And the unwillingness to suffer in the form of our reputation, our finances, or even our physical life or livelihood for the advancement of the kingdom of God and the salvation of the people around us. It's selfish. But the one who stands firm in their faith to the end will be saved. We're going to be persecuted for our faith in God as we espouse the word of God. We are going to turn away or embrace our faith in God as we embrace every word that comes from God. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. It's, it's an all-in kind of thing. And, and, and so what is my point? It's not that there's going to be persecution in the world for our faith in God's word, it's, it's that there's going to be persecution in the church for our faith in God's word. And there's already persecution in this church for faith in God's word. So the Lord told me, he said, you know, every time, Brian, you've talked about anything that's a hot button topic issue, relating it to scripture, interpreting the times through scripture, people get mad at you. You know that. I said, yeah, I know that. It's hard, Lord. They're struggling. They're good people. But I've always felt like we are doctrinally and theologically one big happy family. I mean, there's only like 80 of us maybe 60 at any given moment. There's always been a lot of turnover in this church for reasons, I don't know, I always assumed it was me, my personality or my whatever. The devil, every church is like that. Almost every day I thank God for this church and for the unity that we have around what is most essential and most important, right? It was like he showed me my mouth while I was cutting the grass. And, and it was like there was a, you ever heard like button your lip? I, I've broken a lot of buttons around my lip in my life. But he showed me there was like a button over here and half of my mouth was free to speak and the other half was buttoned down. He said, you've been speaking with half a mouth about a lot of things. And some of that's good. You're being careful. But beware if you unbutton your lip and you speak with a full-throated defense of the gospel, the good news of God in context of all the news of God, all the things of God. As sin becomes more overt and you deal with it in a way that is more overt, get ready because not only will there be persecution in the world, there'll be persecution in your church. And as you've experienced in the past, you will experience in the future, maybe even in greater portions the loss of friends and people that you love that are very, very close to you. 
So I said, Lord, what do you mean? Get ready. Is it, is it coming? He said, no, it's here. I said, who is it? He said, it's not a person. It's a spirit. And it's here. Well, can we bind it? Can we cast it out? You can try, but they're going to bring it in every week. You're going to have to keep doing it over and over again. And so get ready, because if you do this, they will do that. It's already here, and he's already seducing or whispering in the ears of many of your members. And so be ready. Sometimes I address difficult subjects in this church because I had an experience the week before that let me know something was going on and I needed to. It's out of my own knowledge. Sometimes I get up here and I get very emotional and whatever because I, my feelings got hurt about something because, you know, you guys hurt my feelings just like I hurt you. We're family. We do that sometimes. I want you to know this isn't my take your paycheck and shove it speech. It's not that. Whether that was a right or wrong message, I'll leave that before God, but I will admit there was a lot of person in that. There was a lot of personal hurt fence in that. I'm not paranoid. I needed to be told. I didn't know. What I did know, I minimized. I understood. I was patient with, and I will continue to be so. But God has shown me that spirit is already here. And if you think about it, it's not paranoid. It's kind of common sense. Of course it's here. He said it would be here. He didn't say if, he said when. It's here. Let me tell you what God is saying to me and hopefully to many of you at the exact same time. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead. So, this is Paul speaking to Timothy, who is a pastor teacher, who's being sent out to churches around the ancient world to teach and preach God's word, the gospel and every other word he adds to it. Very first verse of this chapter, Paul says to him, in the presence of God, God says to me through this, maybe to you, and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, with this bottom line in mind before you hear what I'm about to tell you, because God will judge the living and the dead, because truth does matter, eternally, beginning now, and ending never. And in view of his appearing, making sure not simply that we're ready to go, but we're ready for him when he comes, and his kingdom, when it comes, I give you this charge. God speaking very directly, I perceive to me, and maybe you. Preach the word, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Be prepared in season and out of season, when it seems to be working and when it's not working. When many people are coming to the faith and when nobody's coming to the faith. When they love it and when they hate it. Just keep doing it. He says, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Correct. When, you, when they're wrong and you know what's right, through the word and by the spirit, say, hey, this is what we think that is wrong and here's what we know to be right. Well, that's correct. This deviation is deviance. This is transgression. It's sin. It's missing the mark. We can gently correct, but we, we got to correct. Well, here's a word that's really uncomfortable. Rebuke. This, go, this is correction that goes beyond correction. 
This is about defiance. And it's encouraging and rebuking, as it says in another place, with all the authority of God, because it's not you, it's Christ in you and upon you. Like rebuke, very, unco- very uncomfortable. And encourage. Pour courage into people who are living out their faith in God through the revelation of God in nature and in Scripture, like encourage that, embolden that, reward that. Today's message is it's correcting some, it's rebuking others, and it's encouraging a third group. All at the same time, with great patience, because Sometimes it will be out of season, and they won't be receiving what you have to say, and you should be patient and generous as God has been patient and generous with you. And careful instruction. Does that mean you always speak in the perfect tone? It means no. Careful instruction means being very, very careful in your instruction. That means many things, but particularly this, to make sure that you're doing it not to please them or yourselves, but to please God. I want to be be very, very careful today to do this accurately and in such a way as when I get in my car and drive home, I hear, well done, good and faithful servant, regardless of the response of my congregation, who the Lord just told me is being actively seduced by Satan to persecute their pastor, maybe just in the embryonic state, for the truth that he's willing to tell, maybe the way he's willing to say it. Sometimes I, I stand, every single week I stand back, I just tell you my process, and, and I drink coffee and I try to get awake enough to do this. And I have a little moment back there where I just, like, I surrender my mind, I surrender my heart, I surrender my, I'm like, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm a man of unclean lips that live among unclean people. And it's like God comes and he takes the call off the altar like he did with the prophet and he puts it on my lips. He's like, you showed up, you've been faithful, you've been humble, I'll take it from here. Trust your tone today, trust your cadence today. Trust the thoughts you're having today, if it seems sloppy, if it seems, whatever it is, don't worry about it. If it's right or wrong, if I need to deal with you, I'll deal with you. But don't wear it too heavy because you've gotten yourself here and I'm going to work. And sometimes I get up here and I've been backstage and I've been joking and I'm barely awake and, and I get up here and it's like I got hit by lightning and a holy bomb goes off. And then other times... I'm, all, I'm, I'm ready to bring it, man. Whew. I've been in this word all week. I'm feeling this righteousness. I, I get up here and I stammer and I can't remember things and I feel sedate. And it's, it's God in control, right? And I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm not saying I'm perfect and anything I say here is the word of God and the persona de Cristo. But I'm just saying, like, he's in control, Not many should presume to be teachers because you know those of us who teach God's word will be held to a higher account, will be judged more harshly, not eternally, but on earth before heaven. You know that God can keep me accountable. There have been times I've gotten sick as a dog because I was walking in the wrong direction and leading people in the wrong direction, and he, he was either going to make me sick and slow me down or kill me. Anyway, sometimes I get up here and it goes boom. And other times I get up here and it goes bang. And, and then I get down there and, and then I start getting the reactions, right? Like, whoo, you know, today you did it this way and yesterday you did it that way. And boy, I, I, I mean, it, it's, like, I, it's like everybody's a critic or a fan. And for years and years, I really took that stuff to heart as if the opinions of the people were the opinions of God. And sometimes they are, but mostly they're not. And the only, the only person I want to hear, well, got, well done, gets in the car with me all by myself. Now, this isn't about me. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because you have no idea how much of this is God and not me. And beware. 
rebuking me for rebuking you or rebuking anybody who stands here under the hand of God for whatever they have to say, whether it be too hard or too light for you when they are accountable to God and not to you because your problem with them may be your problem with God. And it may not be them that you're rejecting. It might be the one they work for. And maybe they have no right to say this, but the one who put them there to say it has every right to say it. Beware being seduced by the spirit that will cause you to persecute Christ through his word, through the people who bring it to you. I correct you. I rebuke you. And if you've been out and among this body bringing the word of God to people and they've been persecuting you and maligning you or mistreating you or marginalizing you or laughing at you or mocking you or rolling their eyes at you or not willing to go lunch with you or skipping the meeting that day because of you, I say this to encourage you. And good news... We battle not against flesh and blood. We battle not really against each other. We battle against spiritual forces of darkness and heavenly realms. This isn't a person. This is a spirit. And it's a spirit we're all susceptible to bowing a knee to. Some, some of you think, man, this, this Pastor Brian is changing. This, everything is changing. Is everything changing? We didn't use it. Yeah, this changed. the world is changing. Things are changing. We're growing. We're It's changing. Yes. It's not in control. It's not under my control. It's not under your control. It's under the control of God. Pastor Brian, I'm discerning. Good. Thank God. You should be discerning. I'm a Berean. Excellent. Usually when people say that, I, I gird myself because it means they're coming after me. But Bereans listened to what Paul had to say, and then they went into scriptures and they studied what Paul said from the scriptures, and they actually didn't come back and rebuke Paul for that. They came back to encourage Paul because of that. Bobby has told me this many times. He said, don't hate the Bereans. You should love the Bereans. I, you're right. So you're discerning. And you discern that there's something wrong with me or something wrong with something I said. That's iron sharpens iron. Correct me, rebuke me, and encourage me too. But if you're going to correct me, correct me. Remember that not many should presume to be teachers, correctors, rebukers, and encouragers because you will be judged more harshly. I am. Remember this, don't think too highly of yourself, but think soberly of yourself according to the measure of faith in God's word, the knowledge of God's word, the conviction of God's word, and the willingness to lay down your life for God's word. Think of yourself in proportion to that. Remember this, the only way to test and approve of his good, pleasing, and perfect will is to no longer be conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind through an understanding of the word of God. And then in response to it, in view of a God that is coming to judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing, his sudden coming, and in view of the holiness and the righteousness, not just the goodness of God, in view of all of that, to offer yourselves as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to him. Come get me. If you correct me, I'm praying that you and I both will have the humility to be corrected. But if you're going to correct me, correct me. You're going to have to read. You're going to have to study. You're going to have to think. You're going to have to pray. You're going to have to get on your face. You're going to have to, because I, trust me, I've already done that before I do this. And so if you're going to convince me otherwise, a visceral reaction at the end of church or a day later when you couldn't sleep is not going to do it. It's actually probably going to tell me I hit the nail on the head. But if you're going to correct me, correct me. If you and I 
humble ourselves and come before God, recognize that this is not a democracy, it's a theocracy, this is not a vote, this is not even a debate, but we come humbly before the throne of God, we bow ourselves to God, together before God, make our living, ourselves a living sacrifice before God, are covered in the blood, filled with the Holy Spirit, and spoken to at the same moment, in the same place, by the same God. We will hear the same thing, we will know the same thing, and we will have unity and power like never before. But if we're unequally yoked, and only one of us has eyes to see, and only one of us has ears to hear, if only one of us has counted the cost, if only one of us is willing to lay down their reputation, if only one of us is willing to suffer financially... If only one of us has had an epiphany of the holiness of God and not just the goodness of God. If only one of us has had an epiphany of the goodness of God and not also the holiness of God. If we're not equally yoked and we're not equally open, then this is only going to exasperate the situation. Because the one God, the one spirit of God, is speaking with one voice. He's not speaking with five voices. If you hear a voice here saying this, a voice there saying that, a voice here saying something else, God is not speaking three different ways. He's speaking one way, and something needs to be reconciled. we got a bright future, a powerful future together. And unified, we will be blessed beyond our wildest imagination. But divided, we can't stand. And if you're here now, a part of this body, yoked to this body, a member of this body, and if you're a guest today, I apologize, you picked a heck of a day to come to church. You're part of the core. You're close to the nucleus. And what happens when a husband and wife, when they get divided? There's nuclear fallout. What happens when Satan divides you from me? And, and you are one one hundredth of the voice of this church. What happens then? Let me finish. You've had enough of me today. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine or theology or application. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their each itching ears want to hear. And that's all of us. I want a pastor that's more harsh. I want a pastor that's more friendly. I want this. I want that. I want a teacher that tells me what I want to hear. I'm so tired of going there and hearing things I don't want to hear. The time will come where they'll they'll turn you on and turn you off depending on the email you send that week and whether or not they think they'll like the topic or the mood they think you're in. And it will begin passive, and then it will become aggressive, because out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth will speak, and it will spread like cancer around the body, and then you'll have a fiefdom that believes this against the fiefdom that believes that. It's just terrible. And look, I'm not paranoid. I've lived this. And I'm also not paranoid. I don't, I'm not, if you think I'm talking about you, I probably am, but I'm not talking about you. It's him who spoke to me in the dark, and now I declare it from the rooftop. It's not me. It's Christ in me. I have no idea what you're saying or thinking. I had to be told. I thought we were good. I know we have disagreements over superficial things. I thought theologically, doctrinally, application, we're good. And the Holy Spirit is saying, you're not good. And as you become more overt, that will become more overt. So get ready and get them ready. For every action, there's an opposite reaction. They'll turn you off and eventually they'll remove themselves or remove you and replace you with a teacher that will keep them safe and keep them comfortable and keep them absolutely ineffective for the kingdom of heaven. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. It'll create a vortex when you don't go hard after the truth. In every circumstance, it creates 
It creates a vortex and Satan is able to fill it with all kinds of myths. And so in a community that is Christian, that doesn't want to quit being Christian, that doesn't want to quit loving Jesus, that doesn't want to ever think that Jesus quit loving us, then the worst thing is we'll have Christian myths. And, and we'll attempt to gain a salvation that comes apart from truth, but comes through myths. But we know that grace can only come through faith in the word of God. The truth shall set you free. A gospel where there's salvation without repentance. Where we don't have to work out our salvation with fear and trembling because I just go to a church that fires me up and I go home like a pep rock. There's no self-examination. But you keep your head, teacher, in all situations. Continue to renew your mind, transform your heart. Let your mouth speak as your heart overflows and live according to the words that you speak. Keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work. This is amazing. Of an evangelist. Preaching the word of God, correcting and rebuking and encouraging with all the authority of God, teaching them to obey everything from the word of God. And as the spirit of God breathes it and applies it in a very personal way, isn't just the work for the mature church. It's the work of an evangelist. It's the good news. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. I, I had to be told. I didn't know. I, I hope, actually, I hope I'm paranoid, but I don't think so. And maybe right now it's very manageable. Maybe it's beneath the surface and it's manageable. It's been manageable for years and be manageable now. As long as I keep half my lip buttoned. But what if God unbuttons my lip? What if your pastor seems absolutely out of control? What if a bunch of people start coming here that just are not your cup of tea because they like the teaching that he brings and it makes you so uncomfortable. I can tell you this, just because you're not in control and I'm not in control doesn't mean that he's not in control and a church that is only under the control of God and not under the control of man is the church I want to belong to. And I hope you do too. Heavenly Father, we love you, we praise you, we thank you for your word, we thank you for your spirit, we thank you that you have brought both abundantly today. We thank you that you have corrected us today, we thank you that you have rebuked us today, and we thank you that you have encouraged us today. We thank you and praise you that we can stand in these hard moments, these hard teachings, because we know not only are you holy and almighty, not only do you expose and judge the thoughts and the attitudes of our heart, you are absolutely head over heels in love with us and committed to our salvation. You have promised to start it, sustain it, and to finish it. And so I lift this congregation up to you today and include myself in it, and I pray for humility. And I pray that we would be humble. And I pray for unity that doesn't come through compromise, but that comes through a mutual submission to your word and a mutual surrender to your spirit. I pray that you would take this unholy spirit out of us and out of this community of people and you would cast it far away and I pray that you would do it and you would continue to do it every single time it tries to come back in. I pray that when it does come back in that the faithful, the core of this church would gather together and would protect each other in our mission together from what is coming in from the outside. I pray that you would do for your precious people, this church, exactly what you do for me, which is when I gossip, you literally make my heart stop. You remind me immediately how much it grieves you. I pray that you would give this precious congregation the ability to discern and even to correct the pastor when the time is appropriate. I pray that as they feel inspired to bring something to me to correct, rebuke, or encourage, 
you would give them the diligence and the ability to go through the steps necessary to mine the word and the will of God themselves. I pray what the devil meant for evil that you would use for good. Thank you for this message, as difficult as it may be to deliver and to receive. Thank you for these precious people, as difficult as it may be for them to get along with me and me to get along with them. Thank you, dear God, that this is very, very real and gritty and good. Thank you for our past. Thank you for our present. Thank you for our future. Thank you that you love us so much you don't give us over to our own devices. You don't let this thing play through to the end. You come in, you interrupt. You bring an internal crisis through your word. Now give us humility, give us healing, and bring us together under your hand, I pray in Jesus' name.